Thank you. I didn't wear my translator, so I assume it's time for me to start. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Media City Biennale for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my work here in Seoul. I also would like to thank Rachel Ricks, Kwan Jin, Sophia Duran, uh, Moon Suki, and Sinai Park for the invitation and coordinating for this event. My presentation will be based on ongoing research projects starting in 2018. Uh, focus on the non-human actors in Northeast Asia borderland, which I collaborated with uh, Dr. Lu Xiaoxuan from Hong Kong University. The focus of the presentation will be about mountain and water. Um, mountain and water, San Shui or San Su, have long been crucial to the cultural imagination of uh, statehood in East Asia. In this talk, I will present the divergent and often contested ideas and concept that derived for them from the landscape, the mountain and water at the Sino-Korean border. The Sino-Korean border, Sino border is naturally divided today by two rivers streaming down from an, an active volcano, which is called Baidusan in Korea and Changbaishan in Chinese. It is an active volcano and is the highest mountain in the area of Northeast China and the Korean Peninsula. The two rivers that stream down from the mountain, namely Yalu or Anmok River to the west and Duman or Tuman River to the east, have been historically regarded as a natural mark of the Sino-Korean border. However, the upper stream of the two rivers remain an ambiguous territory between the two states because of the complicated river systems, almost impossible to define the stream of origin. So in this picture, uh, in, this, in, this, in this ancient map, which is called 24 garrisons in Hangindo, uh, you can see uh, there is this, um, 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 the Baitusan in the middle, and also you have these two three rivers that reach towards the, um, the mountain. But the upper stream of the uh, rivers stay and indetermined. And also in this map too, this is a map uh, that is actually showing now at the um, History Museum of Seoul, which is very nearby from here, uh, called the General Map of Eight Doors in Chosen, in which you can also see the um, Paitusan and the two rivers, uh, where below the mountain uh, you see this ambiguous, undetermined territory um, of the two river upstream. So in 1712, a joint inspection between Qin official and Chosen official was conducted to trace the exact upstream location of the two rivers. A demarcation stale was eventually installed approx an approximately five kilometers southeast of the mountain summit. The demarcation led to significant contradictions and consequences. From Joe Mansi's point of view, all Korean mountains can be read as the offspring of Paitusan. But the 1712 demarcation placed the secret Korean ancestral mountain outside of the Korean territory, a conflict between geography and geomancy. The anonymity of Paitusan as an ancient mountain of Korea outside the Korean territory lasted until mid 20th century. During the, de during the deterioration of Sino U uh, and of Sino Soviet relations in the late 50s, China made a significant territorial concession to consolidate support from North Korea. A Sino-North Korean border treaty was signed in 1962, which realigned the Korean Sino border northwards to cut through the middle of Heaven Lake. It was only until then that the summit of Changbai or Paidu became the official border mark between China and North Korea. It is worth noting that stories about mountain and water in this borderland are not only about China and Korea. Historically, there are many actors and agents shaping the landscape as well as the cultural political meanings of them. This area has been a territory of geopolitical contestations involving multiple actors and witnessing events with significant legacies, including the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905, the an annexation of Korea by Japan in 1910, the establishment of Manchukuo in 1932, the partition of Korean Peninsula in 1945, and the beginning of Cold War in East Asia since 1950s. 
For instance, for Japan, this region was entry point to its two most important colonies, Korea and Manchuria, in the first half of the 20th century, and it was the ground of the Japanese dream to build its pan-Asian empire. And for Russia, this region was the frontier of its territorial expansion into Asian Pacific area in 19th century. In this presentation, however, I will only focus on the notion of water and mountain in the context of China, North Korea, and South Korea. By examining the different meanings of the mountain and the water, I will show how the cultural associations with nature in this space are deeply entangled with historical legitimacy, capitalist desire, and imagination for nation state.观众朋友大家好2018年的中央一号文件 要向反对四风一样，下级。厕所问题不仅关系到旅游环境的改善，也关系到广大人民群众工作生活环境的改善，关系到国民素质提升、社会文明进步。习近平总书记对此高度重视，十分关心。党的十八大以来，他在国内考
여러분 오직 백두의 이 세상에 없습니다 백두산으로 가는 길 이종훈 시대에 사는 사람이라면 언제나 백두산을 안고 살라 오늘의 김대장 김정은 상고 백두산아 난 밀림 속에 타오르는 모닥불 쏠지 않던 빨지산들의 강의한 그 정신 The landscape of Baidusan and Duman River also have significant presence in North Korean propaganda. They not only connect with ancestral mythology of origin, but also key source of revolutionary legitimacy. In the official narrative, the young Kim Il-sung fled, fl fled from the Japanese rule of the Korean Peninsula in the 1920s. By crossing the river, Kim Il-sung entered Manchuria, back then a liminal space between China, Soviet Union, and Japan. It is in this ancestral secret landscape that Kim Il-sung transformed from young nationalists to a mature revolutionary hero who later crossed the river back to lead the liberation of Korean people. The guerrilla force led by Kim was even also called Baitusan generals. Robert Winston Chesters once points out the influence of Christian theology in North Korean hagiography and how the story of Kim Il-sung's river crossing echoes to the story of Exodus. Given Pyongyang's reputation as Asian's Rome in the beginning of the 20th century, the analogy might not be coincident. Today, the mountain and river are space for commemoration. In 2015, on the 19th anniversary of Kim Il-sung's famous river crossing, hundreds of North Korean students re-performed Kim Il-sung's 250 miles journey on foot traveling from his hometown village to the border. But of course, the, re the reenactment did not include the actual river crossing. Even, Ki even Kim Jong-il, the son of Kim, Kim, Kim Yo-sang, was said to born in a guerrilla camp at the foot of Baitu-san, even though his actual birthplace was Russia. Here, the ancestral status of the landscape conflates with, with lineage of the Kim family, and its effect goes beyond symbolic level. In 2013, the term Baitusan bloodline was included in North Korea's official doctrine. For South Koreans, a visit to Baitusan was not possible until 1992, when China and South Korea finally established diplomatic relations. It is often, often believed that today the rigidity of borderland has given, way to to given, has given way to extraction and commodification of natural resources, driven by commercial interests that traverse borders. But a series of incidents in the 2010s reminds us how the extractable natural resource still remains an important source for cultural identity and political imagination. In 2011, Nongxin, South Korea's largest processed food manufacturer, announced its, announced its establishment of a bottling water plant in Antu County at the foot of Changbai or Paidu in China's Jilin province. For Antu County, it is a successful case of local government's effort to attract overseas investment. For Nongxin, 
It is a strategic move in response to a market crisis, because earlier this year in 2011, Nongxin has lost its monopoly of Sandu, San, Sandasu, the water extracted from Halasan, a volcano mountain in Jeju Island and the highest mountain in South Korean territory. To conjure up a new water product in order to reclaim market share and to compete with the water from Halasan, the co-to-co only volcano bedrock water in South Korea. Now monopolized by Guangdong Pharmaceutical, there could be no better choice than the water from Paitusan. In the traditional Korean Jomansi interpretation of mountains, known as Baidu Degen, Baidusan and Halasan are respectively the northern and southern ends of the spine of Korea. If Halasan is referred to as the grandmother of Korean mountains, Baidusan would be the grandfather. The fierce corporate competition for market shares entangle with the Confucius order of patriarchy. Nongxin's move to establish water bottling plant in Antu County was soon followed suit by Chinese newcomer Evergrande. Evergrande was the second largest real estate developer in China of 2014, and its interest in bottling water marked its effort to diversify its business. The, ing the inauguration of the um, Evergrande water brand, which is called Evergrande Spring, could not have been made more nationalistic. On November the 9th, 2013, the second leg of Asian Football Championship final kicked off in Guangzhou. The final match was between K-League champion Seoul FC and Guangzhou Evergrande, which was owned by Evergrande Corporation. Given China's perennial Korean phobia in football and the fact that this was the first time a Chinese club entered Asian cham Championship final in the uh, 21st century, this game was tinted with heavy nationalistic atmosphere in China. The Evergrande Spring appeared as the chess sponsorship of the Guangzhou Evergrande team. With the score of Elkson de Olivia Cardoso, a Brazilian player who later became the first naturalized player for China, renamed as Ai Kersen, Guangzhou Evergrande kept the trophy at home. Soon after, Evergrande commissioned a multi-million dollar advertisement to increase outreach of the water brand. Around this time, Korean drama, My Love from the Star, met unprecedented success in China, starring Kim Su Xian and Jun Ji Xian. To borrow from their exploding popularity, Evergrande signed the Korean stars, the duo, with a 8.9 million US dollar contract for a series of commercials. These high-cost commercials, which were supposed to be culturally neutral and apolitical, met unexpected backlash in Korea. Korean nationalists reached against the two stars for their appearance in a commercial that wrongly called the ancestral mountain Chang Bai San instead of Bai, Bai Du San. <laughs> The duo Korean stars temporarily backed out of the commercial, but later decided to continue because to revoke the contract would result in millions of dollars of fine. In one of the commercials, Kim Su Xian called on his fines, if you like me, drink Evergrande spring water. The innocuous soft masculinity of Korean idols, which are often considered capable of crossing boundaries in Asia, encountered a, block, uh, a blockage in reality. 
The blockage of the flow of capital reminds us that the mountain and water in the northern eastern Asian borderland are not only physical entities powered by nature, but also a biography, a romance, animated by our tangled love affair with imperialism, communism, capitalism, neocolonialism, nationalism, and our desperate, helpless infatuation with consumerism. Thank you. Yeah,여러분,늦은시간까지,이렇게,또,함께,자,루,해,주,시,고,에,저,는,최근,3년,간,이,시,간,에,사,실,깨,어,있,었,던,적,도,없,고,저,아,기,가,어,려,서,밖
이곳에서 모은 어디에 있습니까? 제 인생에 있어서 가장 큰 변화는 아마 독일로의 이주라고 생각합니다. 저는 2001년 독일 베를린으로 이주해서 현재까지 거주하고 있지만 좀 현재까지도 특정 국가의 단단한 기반을 가지고 있지 않습니다. 어, 저는 이 상태를 어떠한 자유로움으로 포장하고 싶진 않습니다. 기반 없음은 굉장한 육체의 피로감과 또 정신적 혼란을 동반하기 때문입니다. 여러 이유들이 있겠지만 가장 큰 계기가 되었던 사건은 고등학교 1학년 때 예고 없이 맞이한 저희 어머니의 죽음이었는데 이후 제 삶에 일어난 폭풍 같은 변화에 적응하지 못하고 마치 새어나오듯이 독일로 나오게 되었습니다. 어, 스스로 이주자가 되어 정체성, 뭐 한국인, 이제 여성이라는 화두가 계속 이렇게 다가올 때마다 사실 저한테는 중요한 문제가 아니고 이야기할 만한 것들이 아닌데 자꾸 화자가 되고 되물으니 거슬리기 시작했습니다. 그리고 주변의 이주자들, 저와 같은 사람들이 또 워낙 많다 보니까 그들이 현재의 모습에서 그들의 떠나온 장소가 재현되는 것들을 종종 목격하게 되었습니다. 신기하게도 몸은 떠나왔는데 나의 정신이 몸이 이동한다고 똑같이 같은 속도로 이동하는 것은 아니었죠. 정신의 파편은 아직 그곳에 남아 있어서 나의 편안한 기억에 의거해서 현재 내 몸이 머무는 곳을 기억 속 장소로 꾸며 나가는 것이란 생각이 들었습니다. 저 또한 이곳에서 여러 사람으로 여러 카테고리 안에서 지칭되는 것들을 경험하면서 정작 제가 떠나온 곳에서는 다시 낯선 존재로 인식되고 사라지고 있는 것 그리고 제가 인식하지 못하는 사이에 이루어지는 어떤 밀려남들을 경험하게 되었습니다. 그리고 이 밀려남을 통해 어, 나 자신의 어떤 상실과 공동체의 상실 또 그렇게 사라져버린 것들에 대해 생각하게 되었고 잊고 있었던 저의 일본인 친할머니가 떠올랐습니다. 저와 같은 이주자로 평생을 한국에서 살다가 돌아가신 일본인 친할머니 후지바야시 상이었습니다. 그래서 할머니의 여정을 쫓기 위해 할머니의 유일한 유품인 지금 좌측 하단에 보이시는 이 낡은 사진첩을 들고 일본으로 무작정 떠나면서 어, 저의 자서전적인 프로젝트인 리무브가 시작되었습니다. 그렇게 시작된 프로젝트 리무브는 2010년부터 2017년까지 수행한 저의 리서치로서 어, 친할, 일본인 친할머니처럼 2차 세계대전 이후에 옮겨진 여성들의 궤적을 쫓게 되었습니다. 제가 그동안 만나온 112명의 여성들의 모습을 잠시 보셨고요. 어, 이렇게 할머니의 궤적을 쫓으면서 마치 그물에 건지듯이 한 사람 한 사람의 어떤 개별 존재를 만나게 됐고 어, 이들이 밀려난 곳에서 만들어내는 어떤 특별한 진동을 발견하게 되었습니다. 사실 이들의 진동은 매우 미세하고 어, 또 어, 경미해서 사라진 듯이 보이지만 이들의 경로를 추적하며 그 흔적을 하나하나 자세히 들여다보면 사라진 시간성에 대한 추출이 가능함을 알게 되었습니다. 이렇게 추출된 시간성들은 현재를 살아가고 있는 개별 존재의 사적 역사와 연결되어 있다는 것을 느끼게 되었고요. 그래서 저는 거대 서사 속에서 이미 시간이 오래되어 잊혀져 버렸거나 현재와 더 이상 관련이 없기에 마치 다 끝난 이야기처럼 박제된 사건들을 이렇게 정주하지 못하는 자들이 만들어내는 사적인 역사를 통해 해체하고 있습니다. 프로젝트 리무브는 이 여성들은 사실 리무브 다시 옮기는 동시에 또 지워지는 존재들이었습니다. 그래서 이들의 초성은 어, 인터뷰 시간만큼 담긴 물의 양으로 지워져 나갔고요. 이제 저희 할머니와 같이 한국인 남편을 따라서 이제 해방 후에 한국으로 이주한 일본인 할머, 할머니들 같은 경우에는 어, 사실 어, 그 당시 팽배했던 반일 감정을 알지 못했고 한국에서는 이들이 일본인이란 이유로 가해자의 역할을 맡게 되었습니다. 어, 일본군 위안부 나 아니면 혹독한 식민지 시기를 거쳤던 그 당시 한국의 상황에서는 이 일본인 여성은 하나의 타겟이었고 어 그렇게 어긴 시간을 한국에서 보내 오신 일본인 할머님들을 만나게 되었습니다. 하지만 아이러니하게도 이제 평생을 가해자로 
가해자의 역할로 이렇게 살아오신 일머니인 할머님 입에서는 피해자 역할과 증언자의 삶을 선택하시면서 에, 등장하셨던 에, 일본군 위안부 할머님들의 이야기가 계속해서 언급이 되었습니다. 그래서 그렇게 또 일본군 위안부 할머님들을 만나게 되었고 이제 증언을 대풀해 오신 할머님들 또 유독 그 혹독했던 시간들 이제 이 이후의 삶에 대해서는 사실 굉장히 말하기를 두려워하셨고요. 그 중에서도 한 분께서 이제 고향이 북한이셨는데 통일이 되면 이제 당신은 통일이 이렇게 오래 걸릴 거라고 생각도 못하셨다고 하시면서 통일이 되면 빨리 돌아갈 수 있도록 가장 가까운 지역에 살고 싶으셨고 그때 당시 DMZ 전방에 어 마을들이 새로 생긴다는 소식을 들으신 뒤에 이제 글로 이사가는 사람들을 알게 되어서 본인도 굉장히 같이 가고 싶지만 갖고 싶었지만 못 가셨다는 이야기를 들었습니다. 또 그곳에 간 여성들은 또 어떻게 살고 있을까라는 에, 질문을 하게 되어서 에, 이 리무브의 마지막 여정지는 이 DMZ 전방에서 그 당시 어, 설계됐던 접경지역에 북한에게 남한의 우익성들을 보여주기 위해 설계된 선전용 마을 에, 112개의 마을 중에 하나인 양지리를 방문하게 되었습니다. 에, 지금 보시는 장면이 그 민복마을의 건설시 에, 마을 네, 모습입니다. 어, 민북마을은 북에서 관찰이 용이하도록 예, 모든 창문과 문이 북으로 나와 있고 지금 보시는 바와 같이 정말 허허벌판에 예, 굉장히 알록달록하게 예, 용이가 관, 관찰이 용이한 어떤 색깔의 지붕들 어, 그리고 겉으로 봤을 때는 이제 하나의 주택으로 보이지만 사실은 그 안에 두 가구가 예, 살고 있었고요. 그래서 이 모든 것이 좀 국가라는 이름 아래에 자신이 선점한 땅의 우위성을 드러내기 위한 세트장처럼 굉장히 허술하게 설계된 거대한 무대와 같은 그런 곳입니다. 이제는 텅빈 무대와 같은 어떤 비현실적인 공간이 되었지만 무대가 아닌 땅에 삶의 공간을 쌓아온 80세 이상의 주민들 70여 명이 여전히 그곳에 남아 있었습니다. 저는 이곳에 한 6개월 정도 머물면서 처음으로 흙을 밟으면서 살았고 또 그때 처음 우리의 삶은 무중력의 상태가 아니라 땅을 기반으로 이루어지고 있고 여기서 땅은 어떤 물질적인 영토의 의미가 아닌 중력이 작용하는 무게, 기반들의 비유적인 의미임을 생각하게 되었습니다. 그러면서 양지리에서 같이 자신이 차지한 땅의 우위성을 드러내기 위해 마을을 건설하는 인간의 방식에 좀더 관심을 가지게 되었습니다. 땅을 소유한다는 것에 대해 그리고 그것들을 표식하는 방법들에 관심을 가지게 되었습니다. 이에 저는 2018년부터 대형 아파트 단지 혹은 거대한 공동묘지 등 이제 개인적 영토를 과시 혹은 유지하기 위한 표식들을 조사하게 되었고요. 어, 거기에 좀더 확장되어서 국가, 단체, 기업 등이 어떠한 방식으로 토지를 점령하고 또 소유하는지 그리고 그 소유를 시각화해 오고 있는지를 좀 조사하게 되었습니다. 또한 표식이 생긴 곳에는 늘 만나게 되는 좀 추방, 추방된 존재 그리고 사람들 그리고 그땅 사이의 관계에 관심을 가지고 추적하게 되었습니다. 특히 다국적 기업이나 여러 국가가 함께 연합해서 이 점령한 딸, 땅들 같은 경우에는 좀 리서치를 하던 중에 굉장히 흥미로운 곳을 발견하게 되었는데요. 어, 칠레 북부에 위치한 알타카마 사막에 어, 흥미롭게도 지금 중앙에 보시는 지도가 그 사막의 지도인데 아, 지금 지도에선 좀 가까이 보이지만 사실 이렇게 가까이 있는 지역은 아니고 어, 지금 A 지점에 세계 최대 규모의 구리 광산이 위치해 있고 그 다음에 이 B 지점에는 국제연합 라디오 전파 망원경 기지가 이렇게 위치해 있습니다. 그 이유는 사실 이곳에 이 사막의 기후 조건과 땅의 조건 때문에 있었는데요. 어, 당연히 뭐 순도 높은 어, 구리의 아주 전 세계 최대의 매장량을 자랑하는 추키카마카 광산이 무, 구리가 묻혀 있었고 또이 지역, 이 사막 지역은 세계에서 가장 건조한 공기를 가지고 있어서 제일 깨끗한 전파들을 수집할 수 있다는 지리적 요건을 가지고 있었습니다. 그래서 이두 지점이 이렇게 한 사막에 모여 있었습니다. 한쪽에서는 땅을 바닥까지 끊임없이 파내려가고 있고 또 한쪽에서는 어 제2의 지구를 찾기 위한 어떤 데이터를 선점하고자 하는 노력들이 좀 마치 인간의 어 인간이 땅을 바라보는 구조를 단적으로 보여주는 좀 수직적인 모뉴먼트라는 생각이 들어서 
어, 직접 가봐야겠다라는 생각이 들었습니다. 그래서 이곳으로 이동해서 한 3개월간을 머물게 됐는데요. 어, 좀 수직적 모뉴멘트의 구조에 걸맞게 사실 이곳은 어, 땅은 오로지 좀 물질을 생산해내는 공장으로서 생산 노동인 주체인 남성이 모든 권력 위에 있었고 그래서 이방인이자 또 여성 예술가로서 이곳에서 많은 좀 위기감과 어려움을 겪게 되었습니다. 이제 광산 도시였고요. 그리고 남성 남자들의 도시였고 또 힘과 강도 높은 노동이 지배하는 곳이라서 이곳에 뭐 작업을 뭐 예술 작업을 하기 위해 온말 어 못하는 아시아 여성이 어. 좀 어떠한 신뢰를 줄수 있는 그런 종류의 거래는 불가능했었고 그래서 작업이 한동안은 굉장히 진행이 되지 않았습니다. 뭐 촬영 허가는 뭐 말도 뭐 얻는 것 자체도 정말 너무 많은 어 시간이 걸렸고 어 제가 촬영을 위한 어 드론 드라이버 하나도 사실 구할 수가 없었어요. 그래서 굉장히 막혀버린 상황에서 어, 마주할 수 있는 게 결국 제 몸뿐이었고 이제 할수 있는 일이 없이 그냥 도시를 벗어나서 사막을 걷고 또 걷는 예, 그런 일을 하게 됐죠. 이제 그러다 보니 어, 토르테라고 불리우는 이곳에서는 이제 채굴이 끝난 광산을 토르테라고 불리우는데 그 이유는 이제 채굴이 끝나고 광산을 다시 흙으로 이렇게 덮어서 쌓아 놓았어요. 그래서 이, 이 모습이 케이크와 같다는 어, 같, 같기 때문에 그렇게 불리웠고 이 토르테들이 정말 이 사, 도시를 벗어나니까 끊임없이 목격이 되는 거예요. 그래서 이곳을 이제 나중에 이제 부감으로 이렇게 드론을 띄워서 보, 보다 보니까 이곳의 흙들은 채굴에 사용됐던 각종 화학물질과 뒤섞이고 또 새어나와서 굉장히 괴이한 형태로 굳어져 있어서 어, 이곳에서 정말 어, 땅이 소유 가능한 물질인가라는 좀 강한 의문을 갖게 되었습니다. 그래서 여기를 이제 드디어 촬영을 좀 하게 되었는데 왜냐하면 이곳은 촬영 허가가 필요하지 않았어요. 그리고 고도 재현도 심지어 없어서 어, 되게 이 하늘에도 이 위계가 있다는 것을 좀 실감하게 되었고 어 제가 우여곡절 것 끝에 만나게 된 어떤 드론, 드론 드라이버도 이제 이 고도 이상의 특정 고도 이상의 어 이상을 띄울 수 있는 또 기술을 가지고 있어서 모든 게 조금 어 촬영이 가능했었던 그런 시기를 보냈습니다. 그래서 이곳을 보면서 아 내가 하염없이 밟으며 걸었던 그 땅의 부감을 보게 되었고 이 척박한 사막 안에 좀 밀려나 버린 것이 단지 다 하나가 아니었다라는 느낌을 갖게 되었습니다. 어, 그러던 찰나의 전파망원경 기지, 국제 어, 전파망원경 기지인 알마저 거기서 촬영 허가가 드디어 떨어졌습니다. 그래서 우측에 보이시는 게 어, 되게 보잘것 없는 <웃음> 이상한 출입증인데 에, 되게 허접한 출입증을 받기 위해서 내가 이렇게 고군분투를 했나라는 생각이 들 정도로 에, 이 전파망원경 기지는 해발 5,000m 고원에 위치해 있었어요. 그래서 건강 검진을 또 따로 냈어야 했고, 근데 제가 건강할 리가 없지 않겠습니까? 스트레스를 그렇게 받았는데, 그래서 이제 우여곡절 끝에 이제 이 건강 검진을 패스, 한 번은 떨어지고 한번 패스해서 이제 그곳을 올라갔는데, 사실 제가 목격한 것은 이제 이 우주의 전파를 모으기 위해서 사실 각 나라마다 에, 자신이 디자인한 그 모든 최, 최, 최고의 기술들이 결집한 안테나들을 이렇게 이 5,000m 고원 위에 옮겨 놓았는데 이제 그러한 기술의 결정체들보다는 이제 이 앞에 어 이렇게 지금 보시면은 이 안테나들 이 주변으로 이렇게 어 회색깔 이렇게 눈 말고 회색깔 이렇게 소산한 땅들의 모습을 보실 수 있는데요. 이게 태양이 뜨는 방향으로 자라나는 네, 땅이고 페니텐테스라고 현재에서 부르는 하나의 결로 현상이에요. 그래서 이제 이 마치 하지만 태양이 뜨는 방향으로 자라나고 있는 고원에서만 볼수 있는 형태의 땅이고 어, 이 태양과 소통하며 반응하는 페니텐테스를 보면서 어, 이 땅은 다른 행성의 전파를 잡기 위해 펼쳐진 어떤 거대한 기술, 자, 기술 장치들의 서사를 무색하게 만들어 버렸던 것 같습니다. 무릎을 꿇고 참회하는 참회자의 모습을 닮았다고 해서 지어진 이름이기도 합니다. 이 여정의 끝자락에 또 하나의 몸이 저에게 왔죠. 에, 이 마지막으로 이 구리 광산을 좀 오피셜한 투어를 진행하면서 이 쿠츠키카막타 광산에서 발견된 이제 미라에 대한 이야기를 
듣게 들었습니다. 이 미라 같은 경우에는 이제 보통의 이제 머미는 이제 머미 이 미라화가 되면서 이제 몸들이 수축이 되는데 어, 이 미라 같은 경우에는 구리가 서서히 스며들면서 이 몸이 하나의 아예 광석처럼 이렇게 살아 있을 때의 무게와 무게와 크기를 고, 그대로 유지하고 있는 예, 그런 형태의 미라였고요. 그래서 코퍼맨이라고 불리우는 예, 미라의 몸이었습니다. 이, 이라, 이 미라의 몸 자체가 사실은 정말 엄청난 소유 의 대상지로 전락한 어떤 히스토리들을 어, 쫓을 수 있었는데 어, 처음 이 미라를 발견한 어, 이 광산의 주인은 어, 이 광산을 이, 어, 광산 채굴권만을 가지고 있었고 사실 땅의 주인은 아니었죠. 그래서 이 광산 주인이 처음에 발견을 했지만 어, 이 광산 주인은 어, 이 미라의 몸의 3% 이상이 구리이니까 이걸 하나의 광물로 어, 선택, 어, 봐야 하고, 그렇기 때문에 이 미라의 주인은 나야라고 주장을 했고, 원래 이 땅의 주인 같은 경우는, 어, 당연히 이것은, 어, 묻혀있는 사람이고, 어, 이 땅에 소속되어 있는 몸이기 때문에 나의 것이다라고 주장을 하면서 소유권 분쟁이 굉장히 커졌었고요. 어, 이게 뭐 여차여차 해서 지금 이 아래 보이는 미국의 버팔로로 이 몸이 걸, 건너가서, 에, 메세에 이렇게 소개되면서 엄청난 선풍을 얻었고, 얻었고 이 미라르의 몸을 소유한 소유자가 결국 파산하면서 예, 차압을 당하게 되고 이걸 JP 모건이 어, 발견해서 지금은 어, 미국의 자연사 박물관에 안치되어 있습니다. 하지만 어, 2001년 초에도 어, 칠레 정부에서는 이 미라의 반환을 위해서 예, 많은 어, 노력을 기울인 걸로 알고 있습니다. 어, 토지 소유제 라는 근대적 토지 소유 개념의 근거는 나의 몸은 나의 것이라는 전제였고 어, 내 몸을 써서 발현되는 노동이라는 행위와 그 산출물 또한 나의 것이라는 어떤 사고에서 기인한 것입니다. 이 개념은 자본주의 사회에서 노동이 거래 가능한 상품의 형태가 되는 근거가 되기도 했고 결론적으로는 땅이 몸에서 분리되어서 땅과 노동이 모두 교환 가능한 재화가 되었습니다. 지금은 땅을 사고 파는 것이 너무나 당연한 일이지만 어, 땅, 뭐 대기, 바람, 하늘처럼 기본적으로 개인이나 국가가 소유권을 주장하는 어, 이것들의 근거에 대해서 생각을 해보고 싶어서 큐비트 아담이라는 작업을 시작하게 되었습니다. 어, 이 작업에서는 사실 그간 조사한 내용을 그저 큰 지도에 지도처럼 공간에서 이렇게 펼쳐놓은 형태의 작업이었다고 저는 생각을 하는데요. 이제 끊임없는 질문으로만 연결된 지도라서 정확한 경로를 지시하기보다는 질문을 바탕으로 감각할 수 있도록 만든 작업입니다. 큐비트 아담은 지금 보시는 것 같이 좀 대형 스크린 그리고 구리, 바, 구리 형태의 어떤 반사가 가능한 바다 등으로 이루어져 있고 어, 어떻게 보면 우리가 이미 다 알고 있는 이 땅의 이야기를 꺼내게 되었는데 이제 좀 무언가 어렵지 않고 노래처럼 편하게 말하고 싶다는 생각이 들었고 아까 레이첼이 예, 얘기한 송라인, 그 오스트리아 민족의 어, 이 땅을 감각하기 위한 새로운 지도 노래로 만드는 그 지도와 같은 약간 그러한 생각을 가지고 이 작품의 설치를 시도해 보게 되었습니다. 전시장에서는 관객들이 좀 제가 그동안 마주했던 좀 거친 땅의 형상들을 좀 맥, 형상들이 좀 매끈하게 조성된 어떤 이 인공 구리 바닥이죠. 이 어, 폴리라고 하죠. 이 시트지 안에 끊임없이 좀 반사되고 확장되는 어떤 이미지로 마주할 수 있었으면 좋겠다고 생각을 했고 이제 전면의 대형 화면들이 각기 달인 기울기들로 좀 바닥을 향해 있습니다. 벽면에는 온기가 없는 어, 민북마을 양지리의 집집마다 실질적인 어떤 온기를 불어넣어 줬던 온풍기 그리고 민북마을 양지리 여성들의 어떤 이 땅을 소유하지 못한 여성들에 대한 어, 소유권에 대한 이야기들 그리고 땅으로 기울어지고 조금씩 틀어진 어떤 화면들 그리고 바닥에 
어, 매끈한 형태로 어, 모든 질감이 거세된 채 보여지는 어떤 땅의 모습들을 좀 몸으로 감각하고 또 조합할 수 있기를 바라면서 설치를 진행을 했고요. 사실 이 모든 조합들의 목적은 어, 서사가 가지는 좀 연대기성을 파괴하는 데 있었습니다. 하나의 연대기성과 영속성으로 인해서 빠지기 쉬운 친화화를 좀늘 우려하고 있고요. 지금 너무 뜨겁게 화두되고 있는 땅과 인간의 관계와 같은 경우 더욱 어, 좀 필요한 작업이 아닌가 생각이 됩니다. 그렇게 저는 좀 작업을 통해서는 몸의 감각을 파편화시키는 데 흥미를 가지고 있고요. 어, 게임에서는 파라텍스트의 조합이 좀 중요한 정보들을 전달하듯이 정작 석사의 무게는 크지 않고 좀 주변의 이야기지만 공감각적인 경험을 통해 어, 다시 재조합해야 되는 그런 서사에 관심을 가지고 있습니다. 어, 결국은 정신뿐만 아니라 어, 몸이 서사를 읽어야 완벽하다고 저는 생각을 하고 있습니다. 실제 몸이 공간의 여러 위치에 발딛고 머물 때 입력되는 다양한 정보들이 몸에서 서로 교차해서 개별적으로 조합이 가능하도록 작업을 구성하고 있습니다. 파편으로 만들어져 이렇게 재조합하면서 어 저는 궁극적으로는 좀 몸으로 읽을 수 있는 지도를 만들고 싶고 그래서 제 작업은 주로 좀 그곳에 가만히 서 있음으로 해서 가능해지는 어떤 체험이고 이는 미디어적 상상을 통해서 경험할 수 있는 좀 일시적으로 구현 가능한 그런 현상학적인 지형 좀 제가 생각하는 어떤 새로운 로컬리티는 바로 이러한 지도가 아닐까 하고 생각하고 있습니다. 어 결국 내 몸이 끊임없이 내 몸이 어디 있는지를 좀 확인하는, 질문할 수 있는 네, 그런 지도라고 생각이 듭니다. 어, 마지, 전시의 마지막에는 어, 이 미라의 몸을 어, 개인의 잊을 수 없는 기억, 땅에 관한 기억을 공모를 해서요. 이 코퍼맨의 몸 조각을 어, 교환을 했고요. 이 기억이 어, 메타데이터로 조상, 저장된 이 몸조각들이 어, NFT로 등록이 돼서 어, 지금 디지털 세상 안에 또, 또 다른 형태의 어떤 지형으로 어, 올려놓는 작업을 끝으로 에, 이 큐비트 아담이라는 어, 작업을 에, 진행을 했습니다. 어, 네 여기까지 제가 준비한 에, 프레젠테이션이고요. 끝까지 경청해 주셔서 진심으로 감사드립니다. 감사합니다. 아, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the um, invitation. Um, thanks to the organizers. So, um, I'm just going to jump straight in to my presentation. Um, so I'm really um, going to talk today about the relationship between um, architecture and displacement. So I'm an architecture, but uh, I'm an architect by training, um, and I've really been looking at this relationship between space, architecture, um, and displacement for the last um, 20 years or so, um, of 15 to 20 years, um, and it really began with an interest in the diasporic experience of space. So that's something that came from my own personal experience, as a few people have mentioned, you know, a lot of us are diasporic citizens of the world. I'm from Pakistan originally, and I moved to the UK at a young age. Um, and then my work from looking at sort of the diasporic experience of space it then moved into um, an interest in force movements in all of its guises. Um, and at the same time, and somehow in parallel, um, I've had an ongoing interest in how we spatially um, and visually represent um, spaces and people in movement, um, both thinking about space and temporality somehow. And then, of course, and I think this was mentioned right at the beginning by Rachel and various others through the through the evening, that um, you know, thinking, of course, thinking with mapping is also thinking with all of the silences and erasures and the colonial ten. Tendencies of this particular practice. Um, so, as I said, my interest is in um, forced movement, and that includes refugee movements, um, but also those moving due to structural injustices. Um, whether you know those uh, structural injustices are economic or otherwise, you know, climate is also obviously a huge reason why people move now. Um, 
so thinking not only with those who have for, who have been forced to flee across geopolitical borders, but then also I think um, there is um, this issue of internal displacement that I've been looking at. You know, people being uh, moved due to conflict, land grabs, climate, as I said, and these are I guess situations that are much more prevalent in the global south um, than in the north. So in Pakistan, displacement is all of these things all at once. This internal, this, you know, across geopolitical borders. Um, so it's quite complex in that sense. Um, uh, so the question of migration, I would say, um, oops, sorry. So the question of migration um, is, you know, is very much present, I would say, in sort of cultural practice and art and architecture at the moment, but it certainly didn't used to be. Um, it, and I think, particularly as I'm talking from the position of an architect, in architecture, it really takes one of two forms, this kind of uh, desire to think about displacement. One is um, to look at spaces like refugee camps, so temporary shelters of all kinds, as you can see. So kind of a quite straightforward engagement, I would say, with uh, with migration, dealing with immediate needs, looking at this issue through the lens of crisis and emergency. And then the other sort of um, way in which this topic is tackled is through this notion of arrival cities that has been made popular by this book um, by Doug Sanders, where really questions of integration um, are, are at the center, but integration into already existing communities, which of course is a slightly problematic way of um, thinking about things. So here we could really ask through these kind of two focuses um, that are coming in relation to migration, you know, um, we could ask where this focus comes from. And I would suggest that it certainly comes from the perspective of the North, um, a concern, and particularly in the context of Europe, you know, a concern for refugees when they arrive at the shores of Europe or in the spaces of international NGOs or when they arrive in particular urban centers. So my work really tries to shift this perspective in two ways. Um, firstly, when I'm thinking about diasporas, I start not from the community cohesion or integration perspective. You know, these are incredibly difficult topics that are often racialized um, in the context of Europe. It's especially uh, this kind of racialization happens, uh, particularly these days around Muslim communities in Europe. So I want to instead start with the notion of non-belonging rather than this kind of idea of integration. And then secondly, in the work that I'm doing that I will also show a little bit of later, um, the research on forced migration, um, the way I try to flip the perspective is to start from the global south or from the places where people um, are beginning their sort of journeys uh, rather than their arrival, as it were. Um, so I want to start by um, thinking about uh, the diasporic condition around this idea of the diasporic home in the city. Um, and it's really a way of thinking about the spaces in the city that are important for particular diasporic communities and how they sort of provide a sport structure um, for those inhabiting the margins. Um, and in this work, it's, it's kind of quite old now, it's nearly it's over 10 years old. Um, but I looked at the Turkish and Kurdish community in Northeast London. Um, and I particularly looked at these spaces. You can see here, Yildirim Cafe, this, this space here. Um, and um, these are small cafes called Kave, um, which is the Turkish word for coffee. And um, there were a lot of these in this area of um, London that I was looking at. And it's spaces where usually men gather. Um, and, you know, there's nothing special about them. It's a standard London sort of shop front, but it obviously holds an incredibly important um, place in the community. And at the same time, as I said, in the early 2000s, when I was doing this work, this was also happening. Protests every single weekend in that particular area on this road in particular um, against sort of events that were happening in Turkey. So if any of you know anything about Turkish um, politics, you might recognize um, the face on the flags. That's Abdullah Öcalan. He's the leader of the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, and he was imprisoned in Turkey. And these, are, um, these uh, protests were about um, his release from prison. And so one of the things that I was really interested in in this work was to think about how let's say the regional concerns and conflicts of another place inscribed themselves onto another geography, which was London in this case, and which is a very different geography, a very different cultural space. And then thinking about how 
you might sort of map that through visual means. And these are some of the material that I produce. And I'm going to talk a little bit about not these maps, but a, a, a different map in a bit. Um, so I was looking at this one sort of particular street as a kind of linear space within which a series of layered geographies were occurring in different spaces um, were sort of incredibly important for the local community. And then at the time that I was doing this work, uh, an architect, and this is the area I live in, by the way, in London, um, and, and, and an architect who also lived in the area, who had been there longer than me, sort of said to me, oh, you know, if you map all of the cave, these cafes that I spoke of, if you map them all on this road, you will get this kind of perfect map of Turkey down to the last village. And I didn't really understand what she meant, but what she was really talking about was the fact that a lot of these places are affiliated to particular regions or particular villages or particular areas in Turkey. And so the names of these um, kave or social clubs um, sometimes say, uh, give an indication of their affiliation. So this one up here in Orange, Adana is a city in the south of Turkey. Um, Besiktas is an area of Istanbul in Turkey. And so I took her comment at face value and I thought I would map um, these cafe, these cafes and see um, what emerges. Um, and so, uh, sorry, the image hasn't changed. I'm just wait for it. Here. So um, this is um, a map of the street um, with the, so, um, so the gray are the buildings and this middle thing is the street. Um, and then in red, I've sort of marked all the different cafes along that particular street. And then on top of it, I've laid a map of Turkey that is sort of, um, well, there are actually two maps of Turkey, one here and one here. And these have been deformed, um, twisted and reshaped to fit the regional affiliations of the cave that are underneath. So you'll see that, for example, Cyprus should be somewhere here, but in this map it has moved this way, and the, the shape of the country has obviously changed, and here's the kind of standard map as reference at the top. So obviously this is not an accurate map um, in the sense of physical reality, but what it tries to do is to give an impression of the invisible geography that is laid on top of the physical space of the street, um, and it is a geography that is absolutely present and something that needs to be um, uh, to be navigated through by those people who can feel it, who are affected by it, and that's namely the, the Turkish and Kurdish um, community. And so there are places where Kurdish people cannot enter and there are places where Turkish people would not feel comfortable going. Um, I didn't say it earlier, but just to say that, you know, the Kurds are the largest stateless people in the world. Um, and so the, the southeast, southeastern area of Turkey is part of what could become a, a, um, a state for Kurdish people. It could become Kurdistan. And that's where the kind of animosity between the two groups comes from. Um, so, as I said, there was this kind of invisible layer that I wanted to reveal in this map. And so if I go back to the point I was making earlier, that rather than speak about diasporas, you know, through these ideas of integration into already existing communities, I wanted to instead think with the idea of non-belonging and the kinds of um, spaces that the communities were producing themselves and the kinds of social relations that diasporic people were making in the city. Um, so um, I want to turn now to a slightly different project where um, I'm going to be uh, speaking about the, the forced migration issue. Um, and this is part of a project that I've been sort of doing for the past five years or so called Topological Atlas with the timeline mapping the contemporary borderscapes. Um, and here, I suppose, if I go back to what I said earlier, you know, this is the kind of project where I'm trying to think about sort of shifting the kind of gaze away from the north towards the global south, trying to think through the perspective um, or through the places that people are starting these kind of journeys of forced migration from rather than their arrival into, you know, northern or European cities. Um, and I suppose there's also in this work a desire to move beyond the language and the temporality of crisis that is always there in questions around migration and refugeehood, and really trying to think instead 
through the kind of mundane and the everyday ideas or aspects of displacement. Um, and this is something that the um, philosopher, the writer, Elizabeth Povinelli, um, describes through the term quasi-event. And this is really where she sort of speaks about kind of events um, that never quite, you know, reach the level of the spectacular, never quite become newsworthy. Um, but these are kind of mundane sort of relations that are, you know, happening in the background and are nevertheless incredibly important. And I think this is sort of the lens through which I want to think about forced migration. And so related to this is the notion of displacement that um, the writer Nob, sorry, Rob Nixon speaks about. Um, and I'm quoting from him, he's, he's sort of calling for a different idea of displacement. And I quote, a more radical notion of displacement, one that instead of referring solely to the movement of people from their places of belonging, refers rather to the loss of the land and resources beneath them, a loss that leaves communities stranded in a place stripped of the very characteristics that make it inhabitable. And so the image that has been sitting on the screen for a little while now, I think, speaks to this idea of displacement. Um, this is a place called Muridke. It is in Pakistan. Um, it is in the Pakistani province of Punjab, and it's close to the Indian border. Um, and the second largest city in Pakistan, Lahore, is just south of this area. Um, so this is an area that is agricultural. That these are kind of small villages around the big city. And in the last sort of 10 years or so, this kind of urbanization and industrialization has been creeping upwards from um, the city of Lahore and really engulfing these villages. Um, and you can see this kind of debris of a kind of fast and unregulated um, urban expansion in this picture, the kind of litter, um, the pollution that's in the air, that's why the image is hazy, the toxicity of the soil. As I said, it's an agricultural area known for a very particular type of basmati rice it produces, which is now, you know, um, being affected. And so this displacement without moving really leads to the large scale movement of people, the kind of the kinds of displacement we hear about on the news of people moving across geopolitical borders. So this is an area where a very large percentage of people have tried to make their way towards Europe. And for people in this area of Pakistan, Europe generally tends to mean the United Kingdom. So that's where they're trying to go. Um, and so I suppose in the work that I'm doing, there is an interest in the journeys um, that people undertake. So starting off in one place because you have to, um, and then all of the spatial and temporal aspects of that movement. So what it means when you move as a racialized or gendered subject across what are incredibly um, difficult borders and hostile terrains and you sort of negotiate them in different ways. Um, and then, of course, where you pass through really matters. Um, so um, this image is of a bus station on the outskirts of the Pakistani mega city of Karachi. So now we're in the south of the, of the country. Um, and it is a place where many people will start their journeys towards Europe. And it's a place really where the smuggling of goods overlaps with the clandestine movement of people. Um, so what you see in this image, these kind of buses are loaded with goods that are usually coming in from Iran. Um, across the border, and those shops that you see in the picture usually tend to have Iranian goods. Um, I don't think you can see it in this picture, but this is also a place where Iranian diesel comes into Karachi, um, into the into the country, into Pakistan as well. Um, and as you probably know, Iran is under sanctions, uh, particularly from the US, so they cannot sell their oil very much. And so this particular area, this region around the Iran-Pakistan border really depends a lot of its economy depends on cheap Iranian diesel coming in across the border. And so, you know, when you talk to people there, of course, they don't speak about smuggling. They speak about informal trade. They speak about the practices of, you know, um, families that have been connected across the border for so long. And it's not something that they necessarily recognize because it's a colonial border. Um, so there is really a community that is coalescing around these smuggling practices and it supports an economy and a way of life. And this is something that somehow um, often gets sort of um, forgotten in questions around forced migration and border regimes and stuff where a lot of attention is paid to the um, way in which um, a lot of attention is paid to the um, way 
um, I've lost my train of thought, sorry. Uh, a lot of attention is paid to the kind of technologies of border securitization, et cetera, but um, what is not maybe seen are the kind of uh, the people that um, service the local actors that service everyday aspects of borders. So the young man you see, in the sorry, the young boy you see in the photograph who will, you know, make you a cup of chai or tea as you go across, the petty official who will check IDs at random, or, you know, simply um, the, the smuggler who will help you pass somewhere across a checkpoint somewhere near the border. Um, so I've been told I've got only three minutes left. So I'm going to skip a little bit. I wanted to talk to you about this particular place, which is a city called Gawadar on the Arabian Sea coast of Pakistan. But I'm going to talk about it really quickly in the sense to say that the reason I wanted to talk about it was because it's part of this. I'm sure you all know it. It's the Belt and Road Initiative by China. And as you can see, Gawadar is this point here. It's part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and it connects the Xinjiang province in China to the Gulf in the south. And so it's a place where a lot of um, money has been pumped in by China on large-scale infrastructure, and it's affecting the local community. And it's also the place where a lot of the migrants that I'm speaking about pass through. So it's a place where a lot of things come together, extractive relations, um, the, the kind of movement of people across borders, and then um, this particular area where we've been working um, is there's also incredibly difficult relations to the state in Pakistan, which I don't have time to go into. But just to say that we have been doing a lot of work with the fisher folk community in this area, trying to really understand their reality, trying to understand how they live between the land and the sea. And if I could just give you one small anecdote of how this kind of infrastructural and extractive pressure that is coming into the area affects them. So the Mahige, the fisher folk, um, before they go out to the sea, they always go to particular shrines that are across, uh, that are located on the coast along um, along this um, area to, to pay respects, to kind of um, ask the saint to protect them when they go out to the sea. And so when China came in and built um, the port, well, it took over the port area and cordoned off a lot of this area. Many of the shrines that the, that the fisher folk would go to are now within the securitized sort of area. And so you can see that the everyday life practices of people are really being affected through this, work, through this um, development. And that's something we've been looking at too. Um, so this is my final slide. The last thing I really want to say is that as part of this um, project that's looking at post-migration, we're trying to make, well, we have made a digital platform um, that really um, tries to bring together the sort of material and stories from our field research through the kind of conversations and workshops that we've had um, and our own embodied experience. And it's kind of, um, we've made this sort of patchy globe, I suppose you could call it, in the sense of um, Anna Singh's idea of the patchy Anthropocene. Um, and the idea really is that that um, you, you take particular narratives and you can go into this globe and follow um, the narrative of particular people through, through this kind of space that's made um, from our experiences in the field. And so it's a way that you, you, know, you might see from the point of view of the person who's trying to cross borders, or you might see from above the kind of view of the border regime and how they see it. And the point um, of this sort of, let's say, patchy or incomplete um, way of mapping is to really expose some of the partiality um, of these ways of knowing and seeing and also some of these complicities and to show that how we can, you know, as Donna Haraway would say, we can never sort of, we all have partial perspectives. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sticking with us, um, especially to Chen Sook for staying up late. Um, uh, we can keep it relatively brief, but I'm, I'm eager to speak with all of you. Um, uh, kind of clear commonality in all three of your presentations is this, uh, this combination of body, border, and landscape, um, and how this, these kind of intersections of these three things. So um, I think my questions for each of you have something to do with that. And I'm going to start with Bo um, and ask a little bit more you spoke in the beginning um, about how the the kind the moving of borders uh, always has these these implication or implications or impacts that we that beyond the human impacts that are only say seen by nature 
and perhaps the way in which uh, a river doesn't respect a new border, right? That this this kind of construction. And I thought I would love within the within the mountain and water um, project and this current project and maybe others of yours, if you could talk more about uh, these actors and their relation to these borders, maybe histories of these extractions and how they've changed with these different agreements and borderings. Should I start? Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Actually, it's, um, it's such a big question. And uh, let me see if I can come up with some, um, some uh, particular examples. But in general, I think, um, you know, the, um, the way how, especially in this, um, this border between China and North Korea, how this notion of um, water, water and mountain, it somehow not only have physical, um, you know, implications, for instance, in terms of capital, um, if you look at the um, the case of the um, w um, bottling water plant that was sort of invested by initially by Nongxin uh, in lo local and two counties, there's basically follow one kind of logic that um, you know this is um, um, this is land of um, the frontier um, origin nature that is pure and uh, somehow and uh, that idea is um, very much agreed on both sides of the border. I mean. Um, so this construction of the idea of um, of um, um, borderland led to physical um, uh, flow of capital that you know bump into the local economic inv um, investment, but then also also bring up lots of um, you know um, economic um, uh, development in this region. So um, um, I'm a little bit lost. <laughs> I guess a little bit more about the. Um the ways that mm, natural elements have refused these new borders, or that they're uncontrollable, or how, you know, how 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 the lake lake and river uh, can't be sort of controlled, or you know, how, how these politics play out as well. Yeah, I think um, in a way, um, in my presentation, there is a like um, um, embedded tension that goes from from beginning to the end, which really focuses on how um, the border, the nature, this river and mountains, and um, have two different kind of operational roles. First of all, in the cultural imagination, in the kind of mythology, in the, um, you know, in the um, uh, imagination of nationhood and the identities, how they function as this kind of very in sacred, this kind of ancestral, meaningful, um, um, you know, entity, not only as something material, but as something really significant. Mm -hmm. But also thinking about how uh, the meaning of um, um, those um, uh, imaginations had impact on each state historically responding to the border. Oh, now we realize actually the mountain is outside of the territory. Or oh, before that, you know how we respond differently. But then the other side of tension is how, in the um, you know in the in the age of global capitalism, how um, natural resources were cons considered as dead object, as something without spirit. It's something you can easily extract, you can mobilize, you can um, buy, you can extract and convert into capitals. So this tension, I think, and somehow the the notion of the um, natural resource of mountain and water really kind of shifting back and back back and forth between being a dead object and being something spiritual. I think at least in the in the first level, and that's the tension that in my presentation, also my project, particularly look into. Um, I'll move on to Chung Suk. Um, you started off, you know, speaking about this urgency of not knowing where your body is or your body vis-a-vis -vis your mind in a, yeah, in a kind of current uh, geopolitical sense, right? Um, but I, I'm very interested in from there this um, this use of you have this sense of of you know all of these self displacements um, and then you have this recurring motif of actual, or the look of actual skin in your work. And I'm so curious about this kind of comparison of the skin of the body and the skin of the border and, you know, and, and these displacements. Uh, 
그 할머니의 여정을 이렇게 쫓아가면서 이제 좀 어떻게 보면 보아는 좀 되게 대립적으로 어 제가 경험한 어떤 그 경계의 순간은 이밤 엄청 이 아무도 정말 어 나와 보지 않는 그 밤바다의 그배 가판에서 어느 순간 누군가가 그배 선머리에 있는 그 태극기를 일본 국기로 이렇게 달아 갈더라고요. 근데 약간 좀 어, 이 망망대해 어떤 그 경계를 넘기 위한 그 들어가기 위한 작은 행위로서 이렇게 국기를 갈아 다는 어떤 누군가의 노동 막 이런 것들이 점점 좀 그러한 어떤 어, 어 그런 그 굳어진 것들이 굉장히 좀 보잘 것 없다는 생각이 점점 좀 들기 시작했었던 것 같고 어, 오히려 정말 이 몸이 이 시간과 공간을 좀 열어 간다라는 네, 확신이 좀더 섰었던 것 같아요. 그래서 어, 가장 좀이 어, 몸과 그리고 몸이 어떻게 보면은 이 피부 자체가 어떻게 보면 감각을 할, 하는 굉장히 여러 미세한 어떤 조직들로 구성되어 있는 것들이라서 예, 좀 자주 저의 작업에도 등장하는 것 같고 그래서 이 몸이 위치하는 것들 그리고 이 몸이 어, 이 육체적인 물리적인 작용뿐만 아니라 이 정신적인 어, 여러 환경까지도 둘러싸고 있기 때문에 굉장히 좀 유기적인 유동적인 형태의 어, 지형 아니면 어, 경계들 이런 것들에 대해서 더 관심을 갖고 있는 것 같습니다. Yes, I, um, there's an immediate sense that your work collapses time in you have side by side these elements of skin and what we think of as a, we assume a corporeal time, a shortened, a certain amount of 100 years or, or fewer next to geologic time, next to like literal, uh, literal rocks or manifestations of rocks. And I'm, I'm curious about that, yeah, this uh, approach toward time. Mm. Uh, 어 저는 약간 작업을 막 이렇게 완결적으로 한다기보다는 굉장히 좀 실험적으로 그 단계 단계들을 해나가고 있기 때문에 좀그 시기에 제가 할수 있는 어떤 형태의 프로젝트였던 것 같고요. 네, 그래서 좀더어 휘비트 아담 이후에 어좀좀더 음, 섬세하게 들어갈 수 있는 사실은 작업들에 더 집중을 좀 하고 있습니다. <웃음> And um, Nishat, I guess first of all, um, because um, maybe you didn't, we didn't have quite enough time for you to be able to speak about the the visualization um, of of the topological atlas. Um, maybe you could just start describing that a bit in terms of these values of priorities of the thinking of displacement from you know the point of view of. The, the people who lost, you know, the people who are who the land that has been lost, or thinking of migration as being from and not to, and how does, how do you begin to draw a map based on those values or assertions? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, I think, um, well, I showed one image in my um, presentation, which was of a woman drawing a map, and it was just this very small line and there was a number written at the bottom. It was the image on a red table. Um, and this was an Afghan refugee that I spoke to who was on her way. She was in Ukraine at that time. So this was quite a while ago now. Um, and she was trying to draw her journey. Um, and it was very hesitant. And she was speaking about going across the border to Pakistan, coming back again, and now trying to go to Europe. And the number in the corner, 25,000, was the amount she paid in dollars to the agent to take her to Europe. And they'd left her in Ukraine and told her she was in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so really at the beginning, um, when I was starting to think about forced migration, these were the kinds of maps we were drawing together with people trying to understand their journeys. Um, but then later, when we sort of started working more deeply as part of the Topological Atlas project, one of the things that I came to understand was that in order to understand this woman's experience, we really needed to understand the way the borders were constructed and the experience of crossing borders without papers. Mm -hmm. And that meant not only sort of understanding that particular woman's experience, but understanding how borders are constructed through a series of technological um, bodily, economic, social relations. Um, and so the idea of kind of 
a topological atlas obviously is a bit of an oxymoronic thing to say because usually ads are topographical and topology is of course about relations that don't break under stress um, and the border is all about stress and violence um, so it's a strange way of saying it but what we're trying to sort of um, bring together in this work is the way in which borders are constructed and then how certain communities coalesce around the border and then how when people pass through something changes in that milieu as well and so the kind of idea of the patchy globe is this sort of non-complete um slightly sort of um, perspectival view on various places um and so within the platform you would be able to pick particular narratives and you can look at the space through those narratives so that could be of the agent who helps you pass through the border it could be of the kind of petty border official who understands the particular local geography very well um, and is kind of somehow complicit in the movements across the border or it could be that of the migrant themselves so we really wanted to show this kind of multiplicity of points of view and show that certain things are legible to some and not to others thank you um, I can open it up to questions. I'll ask one more while you're thinking. Um, do you see borders, Nishat, um, do you see borders as, as localities, as their own kind of particular unique localities um, that have some other, you know, kind of, and I mean, of course, they're not all flat things, but based on the kinds of transactions and the kinds of um, yeah, the kinds of trades and the, and the kinds of people who are are forced to or, or choose to be there. Um, yeah, is it does this does this form a new kind of place that is that is beyond the city or state? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, in the places that where we've been working, you know, no one actually um, acknowledges that border or hasn't done for a long time. And now the border is hardening and is producing other relations. But for those people, it was a kind of continuous space because these are colonial borders. And so when the border hardens, it produces different kinds of localities and different relations that are sometimes antagonistic, but other at other times they somehow managed to cross over. So some of the practices of smuggling oil are, you know, to are based on kind of long-term familial relations across the border. And so they sort of question also, I think, economic relations. So it's interesting that usually when we think about oil, we think about capitalist economies that are built on the back of, you know, petrol and oil. But actually in this particular place, because of the sanctions and because of the colonial history, oil is producing a kind of anti-capitalist sort of um, relationships, which in itself I think is incredibly contradictory and worth thinking about, right? What does that mean in the context of climate change, et cetera, et cetera? 